Well, regularly on our podcast, we try to keep on top of issues such as food security or perhaps more accurately, food insecurity. We connect with farmers and look at farming today. Just recently, we talked with Cheryl and Jolly Nagel on what the restrictions on fertilizer use would mean for feeding the world. Uh, and ourselves. And today in a little bit, you'll meet two young Saskatchewan farmers who are, as the old joke goes, outstanding in their field. Cody Straza and Allison Squires of Upland Organics near Wood Mountain were named Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers. We will explore what organic farming means in 2022. But before you meet them, we're going to check in with Dr. Sylvain Chalabois. Politics of proteins. Yes, that's what I said. The politics of proteins. Why governments and other organizations want to impose food choices on us, he says, often to serve their climate agenda. Seriously, that's what he said. Dr. Chalabois, director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. He's got his own podcast on this stuff, too. What do you call it, uh, Sylvain? The food professor? It is called the Food Professor Podcast. There yes. you go. Okay, we're even going to give you a plug for that because you come Thank on this you. one, and I love that too. And we've <laughs> actually found you in Halifax today. Absolutely, yes. And thank you for uh, for another invitation. Really enjoyed our chats. Yeah, no, it's it's good that we keep at this. I've just spent most of the summer in Saskatchewan, where you're dealing with farmers literally every day and the and the issue of the fer- p- proposed fertilizer ban is huge weather every single day uh drought too much sun you know it, it's their life is unbelievable um where where do you think let's just start on that one quickly because we did talk to Sherilyn about it as well what do you think is happening on the fertilizer ban front I'm not sure. And I, I know Sherilyn and I know her views and I, I think yeah. uh, her views are bang on. I mean, I think uh, farmers have every right to be concerned. It's not, it's not a ban yet. Uh, no, we're not talking yet. about, Proposed. yeah, but it is important to recognize that there's potentially a, a roadmap towards a ban. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now in Europe, in some parts of Europe. And so, I mean, I, I think there's there's an underappreciation for what farmers are actually doing, how how important they are, how how uh, how they're they're great environmental stewards, and they right. they don't they don't really waste fertilizers; it's money, and so they're very careful. And over the years, uh, they've been they've been very motivated to uh, reduce the use of fertilizers and 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 and, the, and use more precision agricultural practices that really allow them to optimize their land optimize uh, whatever they're doing to increase yields so that's really what farmers do and so they've actually done they've come a long way already and, and now this this new uh, target by 2030 i think is thrown at them unfairly because uh, it again it doesn't really recognize what they've done already and the 30 percent really uh is linked to some fuzzy arithmetics uh and i think you know that senator i mean it's yeah. coming out of nowhere it seems to be like a blanket approach towards any sectors and that's fine just say it uh the, pr- the problem yeah. with food is that stakes are much higher we're talking about food insecurity as you said and if you compromise the ability of farmers to grow more food well especially this year with what's going on in ukraine and everything else it's really going to be difficult and we saw what happened in the netherlands i mean it it cost a cabinet minister his job there because the farmers were coming in and saying look this is what we do we produce food to feed the world and we can't produce more food in the face of all this other stuff if we can't fertilize our crops i mean it's, it's pretty simple you have to work with farmers and, and the Minister of Agriculture, I think, abdicated really when you look at yeah. how it happened. I think there was this recognition that perhaps farmers were right, are right. And and I think, I mean, there's I've been on part of a few panels over the last uh, several weeks, and I, I think it points to how 
uh, the government is not necessarily listening to farmers or doesn't yeah. want to listen to farmers and they're the experts. And, and I sense as you do, I'm sure Senator, I, I, I do sense a lot of frustration out there. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Now you've been writing a lot lately before we get into the politics of proteins, because we actually did talk about that with, um, with Sherilyn as well, uh, that you know, whether or not we're going to, you know, this, this, whole approach to don't eat meat and 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 cows are really bad for the environment. I mean, there's a serious side to it, but really. But I, I want to just talk to you a bit about food inflation because the prices are going up and they keep going up. Now people are arguing about where we're whether we've peaked or not. What's your thought on on all of that? Well, we'll we'll know more soon. Uh, we'll see uh, August numbers. Uh, I believe it's going to be on September twentieth, and yeah. so hopefully uh, we'll see some evidence that uh, that food inflation has peaked in Canada. We believe that it has peaked because when you see uh, marginally, the pace has slowed down the last couple of months. So it's reassuring. And frankly, it gives more breathing room to the food industry. What yeah. people may not know is that uh, if when, when you're dealing with a food inflation at 10%, it, it creates a lot of tension within the system. People don't necessarily agree on terms, on prices. Uh, you'll see stop sales. That's exactly what we saw between Frito-Lay and Loblaws a few months ago. Yeah. There's more stop sales out there. I know it's not being publicized, but it, there's a lot of tension. So let's hope that things are do calm down to allow the industry to better plan uh, and, of course, promote. Uh, that's the thing. When you don't know yeah. exactly what happens to food prices, how can you possibly offer deals to consumers? That's the problem. But there were there was a lot of criticism of the big food chains across this country too that they could have done more. Could they have done more? Uh, so you're uh, alluding to our reports on greed inflation, and yes, uh, yes there's and, and frankly, uh, Senator, I, I think some of the criticism is. Uh, is uh, is merited uh, given what has happened over the years uh, and i'm referring to the bread uh, price fixing scheme loblaws right, admitted right. to a price fixing yep. scheme for 14 years so i think consumers have every right to be uh, skeptical however as a lab we are we were skeptical too we actually uh, we did a deep dive into uh, the financials of the top 3 uh, uh, grocers in Canada, Empire, Sobeys, uh, Loblaws, and Metro, we couldn't find any evidence of, of, of greedflation. Uh, margins are two to four, two to four percent steady over the last five years. Uh, and, and a lot of the profits uh, are actually coming from pharmaceutical chains, pharmacies, not necessarily food, because the cost to distribute that are food, in the stores that are that's right. in the stores. The exactly. cost to, to yeah. distribute uh, food has gone way up. So again, it, the, all these numbers are public, but is does greenflation exist? Possibly because we haven't looked at all the verticals. We have concerns with beef. We have concerns with seafood. We have concerns with dairy as well. Uh, but then you're dealing with a lot of private contracts. We don't have access to all that data. So, but we do have concerns for sure. And and the supply chain issues are still real. I know a, a rail strike has just been averted yes. south of the border, at least for now. But are we still having issues about just getting things here? I think when you talk to uh, to to uh, logistics uh, logistical companies, uh, they'll always tell you one problem they have: it's labor. Uh, labor is a problem, and so I think really this automation agenda. The use of robotics uh, is is really going to uh, shift. Uh, I think more and more companies will invest, driverless trucks, uh, you name it. I mean, a lot of things are on the table for many companies because labor is just tough. It, you see, Senator, logistics are a, an yeah. obscure part of our economy. Uh, yeah. Kids, when they go to school, they don't think about logistics the way they think about computers or Bay Street. So we haven't done a good job selling these jobs, selling these industries to uh, to students, uh, whether it's, it's in careers, high school or universities. To do, yeah, no, no, yeah. for sure. It's hidden. But, but that everybody's facing that same issue. I mean, whether you go into a store or a restaurant or a grocery store, it's it. There's there's nobody there. People That's are right. still not 
coming back to work just yet. And, and that's a whole other issue. Okay, I really, I want to get to this politics of proteins. I mean, this debate goes on all the time about the degree to which uh, cows, uh, animals contribute to the greening or the, the to the climate change problems. And I think that's a real issue, I mean, in the sense that they're there and that the production of meat and other proteins, even including dairy, is an expensive process and a costly one to the environment. But I really don't want to be told what to eat. Especially by the government uh, <laughs> for uh, for ambiguous uh, yeah. motives. That's the thing. What, what's going on right now around the world is 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 quite concerning, to be honest. Uh, I mean, really, yes, the science is there. Some proteins will require more, uh, will uh, generate more carbon emissions than others. We know that. Uh, but I, I see four headwinds for th- our livestock industry. Uh, the environment, climate change. Uh, also, you'll have the ethical treatment of animals. That's another one. Yeah. Uh, also, health. And finally, price. Uh, if you go to the grocery store, you'll notice that the uh, meat counter is much more expensive than before. So it sure is. What, yeah. what we've gained the last few years is... Uh, is more choice as consumers. We've th- this beyond meat invasion. I know a lot of our friends in the livestock industry don't like it, but we do offer uh, consumers more choice. That was market driven. Now, what we're hearing now is the state, a moralistic state, imposing, <laughs> uh, imposing some choices and perhaps even eliminating some choices. Um, you saw in Newfoundland, they now have a sugar tax on beverages. That's again, that's an indication of a moralist mistake. A, a government actually enforcing, enticing people to make certain decisions, and that's a dangerous place to go. Politi- politicizing proteins, yeah. to me, is is a no no, especially when, we, uh, when you have a democracy trying to respect uh, consumers, people. You you just now you've raised another issue, but these the t- sugar taxes, these taxes on things, you you say they don't work anyway. Not only are they a bad idea, they just don't really work. So let's go back to Newfoundland. A yeah. sugar tax, nine million dollars in revenues for the government. But what is likely to happen is that the uh, the increase in tax will be absorbed by the supply chain because the margins are very high. Retail prices yeah. won't be impacted. Nobody's going to see a difference. And on top of that, uh, my guess is that it will discourage industry to invest in the province because all of a sudden, well, okay, if sugar is the menace, is the sin, yeah. will my product be targeted next? And that's the problem with these sin taxes because you discourage investment from company from companies looking at your market, looking at your province, and they're looking at investing. So in a few years from now, Newfoundlanders may actually have fewer choices as a result of a policy like that. Yeah, so it comes back around that way and then fewer choices. It's it's back to the same issue, who decides what choice we have. So basically where you're at is go ahead with your Beyond Meat products and your plant-based products, go ahead. Consumers want them, let them choose, but don't then at the same time ban access yeah. uh, to traditional meat and dairy and poultry products. I must say the prairies are uh, have everything to gain by seeing a, a more pluralistic view uh, on proteins. Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at what's going on with Proteins and Trees Canada. Look at what's going on with AGT. I mean, we we'll look at what's going on with uh, with uh, all of, all of the investment going into Winnipeg and Calgary and and Saskatoon. I mean, there's lots yeah. going on there, and that's due to the fact that we've democratized protein, which is great. But imposing uh, targets to try to eliminate options goes against uh, our human nature. We've been eating meat for thousands and thousands of years. It unifies us. We actually always have meat to celebrate uh, holidays and Christmas and all these things. Barbecues yeah. and yeah. it's part of our culture. It's part of our heritage. And, and, and that's really tough for a lot of people to swallow. Well, no pun. <laughs> No pun. 
I mean, that's the point. Let us explore these new options, but we don't have to demonize the traditional ones in order to embrace the new ones or at least explore. Now, the other thing I know you've been on about here, and I, I'll confess my huge interest in this, which is a new report that says Canadians are drinking too much. The Canadian Centre <laughs> on Substance Abuse and Addiction, funded by the government, says stop drinking. What do they say about marijuana <laughs> just asking that's right <laughs> so legal it's legal so yeah so what are they really saying i mean the the notion seemed to be no alcohol is good the doctor used to say oh well have a a drink once a day or and if you're a big guy you can afford more than that you know you might be able to have two but now they're saying that this is the new cigarettes this is this is yeah, no, absolutely banned. the guidelines uh were awkward i think uh they came out of the blue saying listen we we drink too much we need to basically set strict guidelines zero to two not to endanger your own health so mm -hmm. i i saw that okay let's dig a little bit deeper in terms of how they came up with this conclusion and i started to read more about this center this center is uh, is uh, is funded by by Ottawa, partially or fully, I'm not sure. This relationship between the center and Al Canada is, it, to me, it's bizarre because it, it seems to me that the center is charged with the task of setting these guidelines. And all of a sudden, those guidelines are now they're consulting the Canadian public until September 23rd with these new guidelines. And then when you go to the Health Canada website, well, the guidelines that uh, were set by the center are on their website. So potentially, the mm -hmm. center could actually impact, again, policy. And the center's mandate is to build awareness around the consumption of alcohol. So, of course, they will want to reduce the consumption of alcohol as much as possible without recognizing that this is Canada. I mean, we do we drink too much? I mean, the question is, I think, a good one. Do we yeah. drink too much? And when you look at the stats compared to other pro uh, countries, where in terms of, of uh, alcohol consumption per capita, we're number 40th in the world. Is that too high? I don't know. Okay, so we're not that bad. And we can blame the pandemic anyway. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> drinks. <laughs> and, and, and I must say, I mean, I, the pandemic got people to drink more. And, and yeah. it, it's a real it's a real issue, I, I think. Yeah, it's important it to recognize that. And, and of course, uh, too much drinking will lead to other societal problems like domestic violence yeah. and yeah. and of course uh uh driving uh while under the influence these these types of things are super important oh, no, so the center's work is is valuable yeah. but guidelines yeah. had to be taken seriously and if they go too far nobody's going to listen to them yeah no i think that's a really really important distinction you're making there and i don't mean to make light of it because we we all have have known loss from that oh, yeah um, but but when you were talking about the sugar tax and the sin taxes, I mean, that's the other issue, I guess, we have to look at if alcohol consumption, if that starts to be restricted, or if it starts to go down, do the revenues, the tax revenues from cannabis, replace the tax revenues lost from less drinking? Absolutely not. No. Uh, and in fact, actually, we've argued as a lab that perhaps legalizing uh, cannabis uh, expanded uh, cannabis's black market. Because yeah. basically, and, and I think you know this, Senator, black I've market. I've seen that. I've seen that, yeah. You, they, they tend to adjust very, very rapidly, right. better quality, better price. And it's out there. We've been talking a lot about it, and it's legal. So it's much easier now to actually yeah. get your product into the market and convert it into some sort of perceived legalized product. So, and and on, on the edible side, which is the area we've looked at very closely, I'm very concerned because there's a lot of edibles out there, and I would say probably the vast majority of it is is illicit. Wow, you yeah. always have so much to say, but please tell me that you think organic farming is a good idea because you're going to just in a moment meet two incredible people. Hey, listen, uh, there's demand for, for those products. Absolutely, it's great. Uh, but again, choice is important. Uh, yeah. and, and these farmers offer a unique, different choice, and that's great. 
It is wonderful. Sylvain Chalabois, director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie, his own podcast, The Food Professor, and a regular guest here with us. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure, Senator. Great, great to talk about all of this. And as promised, coming up right now, an interview on organic farming from good old Saskatchewan. Take a listen. Well, a young family of Saskatchewan producers have been crowned. I use that word. Well, we'll get into that in a moment. (laughs) They've been crowned the province's most outstanding young farmers this year for all of their innovative practices. Cody Straza and Allison Squires. I, this is funny because I know an Allison Squires in Wadena. Yes, so I know uh, one too. <laughs> <laughs> so you run something called Upland Organics, uh, and you farm around Wood Mar- Mountain, Saskatchewan. You're in the running now for a national competition, right? So you might win that in November. It's fingers crossed. Fingers, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we, we'll begin with congratulations. This is really a, a great accomplishment. How long have you been at this? Well, thank you very much. Uh, we started our farm together in 2010 at, uh, at Wood Mountain. Um, we started off as an organic farm then. And uh, about uh, 2016, we, we discovered the regenerative farming aspect. So we've incorporated that with the organic farming. And okay, then, you want to give us a little definition there before? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, regenerative farming is um, it, it's another, what would you call it, a system of farming that focuses more on the soil health, on the soil biology. Um, and it it's uh, for everybody, it's not organic farmers or conventional farmers. Uh, and it's about, um, one, one of the aspects is reducing the disturbances. So as organic farmers, we're really trying to reduce our tillage. And we're okay. learning from conventional farmers who are really trying to reduce their chemical and fertilizer inputs right. and seeing positive results. Like yields are increasing by decreasing the, these disturbances. I mean, there used to be that you would run a crop for a couple of years and you would, you know, let it go follow and, mm-hmm. and leave it and then plant a different crop and use different crops to actually rebuild the soil. Is that part of what you do, or absolutely? Diversity is one of the, okay. the main pillars of um, of the soil health movement, and uh, so yeah, we'll have a fairly long crop rotation, and then we have a, a cover crop year or a soil building year. Okay. And traditionally, as organic farmers, we would plant something like peas or lentils that are legumes, fixed with nitrogen, and then we would plow it into the ground or disc it in and and have it decompose in the ground and provide that nitrogen for the next crop. Now we're uh, planting more of a diverse blend of peas and oats and other goodies that go with it. Yeah. And instead of working it in, we are grazing it with cows and we're doing a uh, very intensive grazing. Uh, the cows are on the cover crops right now. We use electric wire to keep them on a spot that there's just enough there for one day. And oh, wow. <laughs> they, they, they graze off the, the top portion yeah. And then they trample the rest to the ground. So they're, they're killing <laughs> the plants. And then they move on the next day. They're cycling all those nutrients mm-hmm. um, through the rumen. And they're um, depositing manure and urine yeah. across the field. And yeah, it's a, it's a very it's a very intense process moving these cows uh, around. And, and, uh, managing. and they don't know that they're being environmentalists by stomping that yeah, stuff exactly. in the ground. <laughs> Allison, I'm curious. You're, you were born... Well, born in Newfoundland, yep. those are your roots. Then you went off to Guelph, which is, of course, an agricultural university, yep. but not what you really were studying there. No, I have, <laughs> I have no ag background <laughs> whatsoever. What were you studying at university? Um, my bachelor's was in environmental toxicology. Um, okay, it's kind of related. Well, I learned a lot about the chemistry side of yes. farming, for sure. Yes. There was many courses I took on, on that aspect, but no, uh, no real background in soil health or plant health as part of that degree unfortunately <laughs> so how did you meet this guy and buy a farm what were you thinking well <laughs> crazy things have happened but uh, I did I moved to I wanted to get out of Ontario for a little yeah. bit you know when you're younger and you want to explore uh, so I went to Saskatoon here for mm-hmm. uh, 
for my master's and then my PhD. And so uh, it was through mutual friends that we met because he was doing, you were doing your, your undergrad degree at the same yeah. time. Yeah, you're, I was in engineering at the time. Yeah. So. And you're in engineering. So yes. that's yeah. like, but you grew up on a farm, didn't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. So did you always intend to go back or not really? Um, it wasn't a certainty. Yeah. Um, when I discovered it was uh, an underlying passion that kind of directed me back towards it. But I spent uh, a number of years uh, working as an engineer. And yeah, I would go home at night and read the Western producer and <laughs> track the cattle markets. And that, that was kind of the turning point of the, the realization that it was uh, that underlying passion of what I re really... It was just there in Yeah, you. it was yeah. ingrained. There's no escaping it. So then how did you talk her into this? <laughs> well, I think I'll answer that. <laughs> I think, uh, well, we have a very similar value system. Right? Yeah. And I think... Um, I was never going to be um, a nine to five kind of girl. Right. So I think for me, what really drew me to the farming lifestyle is the fact that we are our own boss. Yeah. So we don't really answer to anybody, which is super um, stressful, but also super, <laughs> <laughs> super freeing at the same time. So a yeah. lot of the changes that we've been implementing on our farm recently, especially, we've been able to do that successfully because we make our own decisions and we do our own, our own research and, and that sort of thing. So for me, that whole aspect of the lifestyle of being an, essentially an entrepreneur and, yeah, and exactly. you know, building a really successful business is, is really appealing to me. So I was maybe going to do that in a different uh, sector, but <laughs> you know, there's a lot of similarities between agriculture and like fisheries, which is kind of exactly. where I thought I would end yeah. up. So uh, it's just, it's actually been really great. I think yeah. Newfoundland and Saskatchewan are connected at the, mm -hmm. at the hip. I just find yeah. when I've gone through an election campaigns, I just find the people are very similar. So, yeah. and we've we, talked about that too, oh, actually. Yeah. Many times We're that. both, I consider them both kind of underdog provinces in yeah. a way, you yeah. know, and yeah. like super, um, but don't uh, mess with us. Don't mess right. with us. <laughs> There's oh sorry. There, there's a lot of similarities between the the outport fishing villages and the the rural yeah, small absolutely. towns that yeah yeah it's, for sure. Then you decided you were going to add three children to this well, mix just because you didn't have enough to do or what? You know what? That's yes. Uh, they are great though. I have I'm biased obviously, but uh, no. We waited a few years after starting the farm before yeah. starting a family, and we needed that time to kind of figure stuff out but yeah. the kids actually um, kind of blended seamlessly into the farm yeah. because there's no rural child care available really in our area Absolutely. it's another whole topic we can do another whole podcast yep. on <laughs> you bet <laughs> but uh, so they always just came with us so I have tons of pictures of all of our babies and car seats and the tractors with me and all this and so they just are used to it they're very okay sitting in equipment and yeah and all of that so. as it used to be Right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how kids grew up, and then we had this expectation that they should have daycare and childhood and be, you know, stimulated in other ways. But actually, you learn a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When yeah. you're out there with uh, mom and dad, and somebody's watching. How how many acres do you farm? How, like, how big's the farm? Uh, we crop about forty five hundred acres. Okay, so that's big. You're a serious farmer. Well, <laughs> for for organic farming, it it is yeah significant. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, you, your primary goal, if I can put it that way, is protecting the soil and building the soil and preserving the soil, maybe even enhancing it. Uh, but you also, you've talked about this lean manufacturing, which I think has to do with how you deal with equipment as well, um, other than the cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, you don't want the lean to affect the cows. Um, it, it's more of a, a business approach and strategy. It's not okay. necessarily a set of rules. It's um, uh, eliminating waste is the, the idea behind the, the lean manufacturing. And that could be um, wasted product being the most obvious, yeah. but wasted time, wasted opportunity. Um, it, it's more of a, a mindset, mind shift than an actual set of practices. And we're trying to incorporate that into the farm too. So when you think, I mean, we see <laughs> other big farmers, the traditional farmers, I mean, they all now have very high tech gear and use GPS and they decide you know, how much seed goes here and how much fertilizer goes there and it's all calibrated. Do you do the same thing or are you doing that yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, we do use a lot of those technologies as well. Okay. Um, but it has to make sense for us to use on our farm. Uh, the variable rate seeding that I think you're alluding yeah. to there, um, we don't really have a direct application for that in our system and it's not worth the investment for us. 
Okay. But the GPS auto steer is something we have in everything. almost almost yeah. everything. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, it, it's maybe a little more pick and choose. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're we're definitely using a lot of the same technologies. So if the markets here had not diversified as they did, I mean, everybody grew wheat mm -hmm. and oats for a million years, and that was it. And then canola, right? I mean, there were some things. But I remember when my uncle was farming, and, and he started to incorporate peas and mm -hmm. some lentils, and that seemed radical. Like, his neighbors went, are you nuts? Like, who are you selling those things to? But of course, now we know. Yeah. We're actually feeding the world. So uh, how do you choose? That's a really good question, and it's a, a very uh, complex answer too. That we like having different things yeah. to, to grow that complement each other, that take different things from the soil, different rooting depths and structures, and things like that. Will uh, deeper root will break up hard pan, and for example. Yeah. But also on the flip side is the the marketing side that just because we can grow it, we have to be able to, to mm -hmm. sell it, and right. but then also balancing that that if we have something that's that's good for the soil and enhancement enhances it. If we can do okay with that, but then we have a, a real powerhouse uh, economic crop, but it uh, uses the others for support on the soil health side, uh, it, it all works out well together. Yeah. Something else that we've been getting into is intercropping, where we put two or three different crops grown in the same field at the same time, and then harvest them all together, yeah. and then separate them. And we've found that you can over yield, you can get more <laughs> out of that than what you can with seeding the two separately. So how do you separate after the fact when you've mixed them all together? Well, that brings us to 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Go where, ahead. Where we built, uh, in partnership with Cody's parents, we yeah. built a commercial sea cleaning plant on site. Okay. And so we use that, um, that facility. It's, it's a commercial separate enterprise, so we also service the community with that as well. And we use that to separate all the different grain types uh, to the buyer's spec. So leaving leaving our farm, everything is clean, clean to like 99 point whatever percent the buyer requires. And then we ship it directly like that. So we're not, we're not um, losing money on dockage or poor quality, right. or anything like that. So we're able to- really So presumably you have to get certified to do this so that your buyers are assured that what they're getting is what they're getting and that it's 99% clean. Well, there's, there's no uh, certification for, for the, the grain cleaning side of things. Um, it's more, we will we'll clean it, then we'll send a sample to the okay. buyers. Okay. And a lot of our buyers we have a, a long-term relationship with. We yeah. work with them every year. So they, they know us. A lot of them have been to our farm. They've seen our fields. They've seen yeah. our cleaning plant. They're familiar with the, the quality that we produce. Where Who are your buyers? Where are they? Are they here? <laughs> are they everywhere? They, they are everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Um, we we try to sell uh, domestically and locally, especially when we yeah. can. Uh, there's a mill just outside of Saskatoon that we love working with. They're identity preserved. That uh, we've sold them uh, spelt, the type of wheat. Yeah. That they mill into spelt flour pancake mix. Put it in a bag with their their logo, their name, and everything. But on the back is grown by Upland Organics. Ah, uh, okay. So cool. There's, yeah. there's bags in people's mm -hmm. kitchens with with our farm name on it. And, but when there's not a market in, in Western Canada or even Canada, we do ship um, internationally. A, a lot of our pulses and lentils go to Europe. Of course. Uh, we, and India, I'm assuming, and um, not so much? Not so much to India, okay. more, more to the, the European market. Okay. And how do you make those arrangements? I mean, everybody has the old vision which you sold your wheat to the wheat board and they decided who, and then that disappeared. So how's this new world work? <laughs> who uh, wants, we're, you jump we're, in. We're, we're very, She'll correct you when you want. Don't worry. <laughs> it happens a lot. Uh, we're very fortunate. We work with a neighboring farm, uh, Remway Family Farms. Okay. That uh, one of the, the people they have working with them there is was an organic grain buyer in Holland. Okay. And is now uh, moved to Canada and is working with them. And he's well, working on the farm, but he's also their uh, organic grain um sales specialist okay and he has a lot of contacts across europe that um, we'll work with him to get directly into those those markets it's amazing really when you think about that that you're growing something here and and what does it take it takes a phone call uh, like you got to get it from point a to point b <laughs> it takes lots of phone calls <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so you're shipping it a lot like you have a separate process that you're involved in 
Um, we we clean it well yeah. by by industry we we call it a, a pre clean. It's ninety nine point nine percent, which is yeah. good for for export. Um, but before the the final store shelf, they'll put it through a more rigorous cleaning just for uh, quality and liability uh, assurances on their end. But um, we'll clean it. We'll put it into uh, containers. We'll bulk load containers, or we will put it into one ton tote bags yeah. and load into containers. Um, we've done some ourselves, but we've also worked with another grain cleaner nearby that will t- provide that service as well. And then you ship it by train to ports and it goes over with yep. other stuff, but it, it's yep. not mixing and matching. No, exactly. It's yeah. a uh, very identity preserved uh, right up till, till the store shelf. So what does, what does, I mean, it's harvest time now. You were on the field yesterday, you we, said. Yeah. Um, what, what's harvest like for you guys? You know, it's it's not our busiest time of year, believe it or not. I would Isn't argue seeding is more it's oh, more it? hectic for us. Yeah, seeding is um, a lot more intense. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's fall, so it's <laughs> yeah. it's fun. The kids are going back to school, and it's not uh, it's kind of relaxing, and it's, it's always mm-hmm. enjoyable to see all the work you put in during the year to come off the field mm-hmm. and. And uh, we, because we have the grain cleaning plant, we can we can start cleaning stuff right away. So the, the, everything we harvest yesterday should be going through the cleaning plant in the next week or so, mm-hmm. and then, yeah, we'll start shipping. The other thing that it's hard to explain to people who don't know about farms is that every morning you wake up, it it could rain at the yeah. wrong time. Uh, we've been living through drought for a couple of years in mm-hmm. this province, more intensely in some areas than others. Uh, Hail storms. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, so talk a little bit about the drought because when you're trying to preserve soil, I mean, it needs moisture and you can't do much about that. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> so Cody mentioned that we started kind of um, altering some of our practices in 2016. Yeah. We farm in, in an area called the Palliser Triangle. Yeah. So if nobody knows what that is, that's pretty much the driest region in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of it Alberta, feels, feels a like bit especially, of yeah. Yeah. in there, yeah. So our drought actually officially started in 2017. Yeah. And I think we had a quarter inch or half an inch of rain oh. in the growing season. Over, well, maybe an inch, but uh, that's yeah. splitting hairs at this point. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that was our first year of drought, and we've kind of been um, in extreme or severe drought since. Yep. So last year was bad for us as well, but yeah. but we had already been through a few years. So in terms of your question about how do you build soil health in a drought, it's really, really difficult. Because <laughs> a lot of what, what builds soil health is plant biomass. It's, yeah. it's living, growing things feeding the soil through their roots. And so and it uh, needs water to grow. It needs water <laughs> to grow. And so, um, but it's also motivated us in a way because the more we improve our soil, the better our water infiltration will be. And that way, whenever rain does fall, if it ever falls again, <laughs> we'll be able yeah. to capture every <laughs> single drop, yeah. right? Yeah. That goes instead of having big washouts, which we don't really have mm-hmm. anymore. Right. We also do soil testing on our farm every fall, and we kind of rotate through all the fields. Um, and we've seen our organic matter improve uh, quite a lot mm-hmm. since we started. So we're seeing these little tiny steps that we're hopeful that uh, once the drought breaks, we'll be able to actually <laughs> well, <go it's>, busters. <laughs> most of the farmers around where I'm say it's cyclical. Like you, mm-hmm. you, you have a seven year run of drought. That's usually how it comes. I had grasshoppers in the car the other day, so yep. Yep. I knew for <laughs> sure. <laughs> that uh, this is underway but do you have to irrigate are there what other mitigations are there um there's not really much available for us for for irrigation um at this point it's not like you got a bunch of sloughs when you're where you are no (laughs) and we're in really rolling hills so there's there's very little standing water everything runs off into the the local creeks and the local watershed like it drains off and um but yeah it's trying to keep the soil covered keep the, the evaporation down, mm-hmm. um, minimizing the tillage, all that to try to conserve moisture. How do you, how would you like cover, uh, you're talking about with plants and yeah, whatnot yes. and trying, but they're also sucking the moisture out as well. Yes, it's a, a give and take that yeah. they, they're, they're taking moisture, but they're also um, providing um, that root structure of the ground. They're giving root exudates back out to the microbes that are uh, building soil aggregates, that are building um, <laughs> your soil We're organic We're just going to pretend we understand this. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all about building the soil structure. Yes. Yeah, the, the soil structure, making it more porous so that yes. 
whatever is there can and be absorbed. Yeah. By increasing our organic matter, for every 1% increase in organic matter, we can hold an extra inch of water in the soil profile. Wow. So that's, that's something we're working towards. It's a long-term project. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're all like Elsa was saying. We're already seeing the, the shift. So it's like positive. this is your your kind of research in real time here yeah. about what not just organic farmers but all people. Even if you have a garden, mm -hmm. uh, you know you could start to practice and use some of these techniques. It, that's kind of your objective as well as yeah, actually ab farming. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot of things that we've been playing with. For example, uh, a roller crimper. It looks like a, a big land roller that you'd roll rocks for a pea or lentil field, but it has blades on it. And instead of grazing cows uh, across the cover crops that we were talking about earlier, you can run this machine over and it, it kind of kinks all the stems and leaves everything attached and rooted but to the soil. they fall over. Yeah. They fall over and the, the, the plants die and are yeah. still laying, covering the surface and yeah. attached. So they won't blow away, they won't shift, but and they're providing that, that blanket, that armor over top of the soil. These are really smart things. <laughs> and we're not inventing any of this. We're, yeah, no, we're finding ways to implement it in a system that And there's that works. international communities of people doing this, oh, yeah. right? Where Actually, our network that we've been so fortunate to build over the last few years is really quite diverse. Uh, yeah. and, not, and it's not all organic farmers either. Right. A lot yeah. of our learning when we first started shifting mm -hmm. our practices was actually from conventional farmers that were already yeah. doing it. And we just had to ad kind of adapt what they were doing to fit into our system, like Cody mentioned earlier. So yeah, that's the great thing about all these different practices. Um, anyone anyone can apply them yeah. to their farm, and it doesn't matter the, which way you farm. But everyone can take a little something and start applying it on their farm. And see a lot happens. of the of your fellow farmers, of course, are um, have had a rough few years, not just weather too. Mm -hmm. I mean markets mm -hmm. uh, and getting caught in political games. China shutting down canola purchases and yeah. now we're in another debate about fertilizers which you probably don't use a lot of or do you? No, we, we don't use any synthetic fertilizers. Okay. Um, we we do make compost our, yeah. ourselves and, yeah. and apply that so um, not, not the same, it's not under yeah. the, the same uh, purview there. but Yeah, not yeah. the same rules so that's going to have an impact on on the output of this well, this country, not just this province, if these kinds of restrictions come in. But you're kind of proposing some mitigating options here, <laughs> if you can't, you know, other alternatives. And there are a lot of conventional farmers that have been going down this path, mm -hmm. reducing yeah. their, their fertilizer use, reducing their, their pesticide uses, and seeing yields maintain or increase as yeah. their, their soils build from not having the, the synthetic fertilizers in the, the soil. I think I think a lot of what's going to, in my personal opinion, help with that situation is uh, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning from different mm -hmm. farmers, and that's how we learned what we've learned. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that uh, that we'll see some movement in place where there will be some of those systems set up so that farmers can learn some of these techniques that will apply directly to their farm specifically. And how do you deal with that issue? I mean, uh, I had an uncle who was a crop sprayer, you know, so he would go and uh, mm -hmm. and spray crops, but on the way home. Um, if you're flying over the organic farm, <laughs> how do you protect your your property from not deliberate but incidental uh, contamination? I guess by uh, by other farms or things like people spraying. Yeah, there, there's a number of, of uh, things that we've done. Like within the the rural municipality provides a, a map, and all of our land is identified visually. Like it's a different color because it's yeah. organic. Yeah. Uh, there's a program called Drift Watch that we're registered with, um, which is accessible to all applicators that they can see exactly where our land is and what the status of that land is. Um, within the, the organic uh, regulations, we have a buffer um, along the edge of our field where we uh, adjoin to a conventional neighbor that if there is any drift uh, just from their, their field, it's contained within that. Oh, okay. And we actually have some really great neighbors yeah. Yeah. and uh, a really great understanding with them that if there ever is an accident or an incident yeah. where there's drift onto our field, uh, they know that they can call us, identify it, and we right. can uh, segregate that out yeah. instead of not saying anything and having it mixed yeah. into the whole field. And then everybody's then, done. Yeah. yeah. Then it's no, a No, I think problem. that's what you have to do and your neighbors have to get you and you have to get them, right? Yeah. I mean, so that you can appreciate what the other is doing and 
you're not trying to convert anybody. You're just saying this yeah. is the way we want to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's really quite an amazing um, process. Like, can this be done on a massive scale? Or organic farming? Yeah. You know, uh, that's a really good question, and it's something we've been asked previously. Um, organic farming, the system itself, isn't really set up for large scale, right? right. Um, we were talking about this on the ride up, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do we envision for the future of organic farming? It's, uh, it's maybe a little bit of a step back into um, s more smaller local yeah. food sources. Yeah. Um, this pandemic, for example, has been a huge impact on the agricultural sector. I think we can all agree on that. Yep, for sure. And I think it's really uh, shown some of the gaps in the in the supply chain and the real yeah. need for like local food production, local um, processing. Like I would love to see Saskatchewan just take a hold of this and just boom in the processing yeah. sector. That would be amazing. Um, beef specifically, uh, it's really hard uh, to for a, pro a producer like us to have our own beef, uh, finish it, and then. Um, have it butchered and sell right. it because there right. isn't that capacity on a local level to do that. Exactly. So, well, there, there's the, the micro, like we're, we're doing half a dozen animals this year, yeah. but to sell a couple hundred, right. we're, we're, we're not into the, the direct marketing as much. And then you'd have to have a different operation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, sorry. No. Yes. So I just, I think in terms of organic farming, I think it, it fits right into that kind of yeah. like mm -hmm. system where you're, you're smaller, more diverse farms, more people feeding back into the rural communities yeah. as well, because you know everyone drives around you know rural communities that are losing their ranks and in our RM specifically, yeah. um, there's nowhere to get a cup of coffee ten yeah. out of twelve months of the year. Never <laughs> so, mind the hospital. Yeah. Well, I had to drive to Moose Jaw to yeah. give birth to all three of my babies, and yeah. that's a two hour that's a two hour stay yeah. in labor. <laughs> you really need people need to understand yeah. that, and yeah. and this does. I mean, when there's a farmer market, farmers market in a little town, I mean, people go. Yeah. Because as also as that population ages, they're maybe not growing so much in their own garden. Yeah. And they only need a five pound bag of potatoes. They don't really, you know need a bin full so well that's so i mean there are people who really believe that's economists who actually believe that's what we have to do oh, for a whole good. lot of reasons we we talked to jeff rubin an economist on this show he really believes that we're going to have to go that route of local production it's partly climate issues but it's just it makes sense yeah especially if gasoline is a million dollars a right. gallon yeah yeah that's a very good point <laughs> that's actually one of our biggest like so quote-unquote inputs on our yeah. farm is fuel yeah and we've definitely seen uh quite a hike this year on that so yeah. Yeah. carbon tax or or just the hype or both or like just the price on the, the, price yeah, the fuel yeah on the fuel and what does the carbon tax mean? Like, you don't do drying in the traditional way? No, we, yeah. we don't. Um, yeah. And with the, the farm fuel exempt yeah. of, from the carbon tax, um, our uh, personal travel is a uh, subject, but other than that, it's Anything fairly minimal. Anything you do on the land. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's fairly minimal. It's just, this is a really interesting conversation, you guys, and thank you. Um, thanks for making the trip in, for starters. <laughs> no they did actually get a day away or a few hours from the kids, but we won't say that out loud. Um, but I think this, you know, you're, you're leading by example here. Well, thank you. Yeah, and you, you're a local firefighter, you are a volunteer firefighter, and you're doing, you're trying to keep this community alive as well, not just your, your actual farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Really, really. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Cody and Allison. So Cody Straza and Allison Squires, Upland Organics out of Wood Mountain. And so when you're in the store and you're looking at that pancake <laughs> mix or whatever it is, turn it around and, uh, and, and give these guys a thumbs up for, for what you're doing and the contribution you're making. Much appreciated. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. All right. That's it for this edition of No Nonsense. We'll see you soon.